your spirits and set our mind upon you. Fill me with your spirit again. Amen. So here I am again. I've uh, fallen into the same sin. And I thought what scripture said was that I was a new creation. And here I am as a pastor and falling into sin and feeling like a fake. You know, just the same sin that you feel like you're never going to break free from. This is my story. And maybe this is how you feel tonight. Do you ever feel like you can't be a consistent Christian? Do you feel like you're... Your soul is literally at odds with itself. You come to an event like this, you feel like all that I want is just, I just want Jesus. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, besides wasting my day with video games. Oh, besides looking at pornography. Oh, besides my girlfriend. Oh, besides this, or this, or this, or this. And you feel like your greatest desire is Jesus, but the reality is, is so often that your behaviors and your desires betray what you say your biggest desire is. Does anyone feel that? Where you feel this war inside your soul? Two passions beat within my chest. The one is foul, the other is blessed. The one I love, the other I hate. And here's the key. The one that I feed will dominate. I've always had to do a battle in, in my heart with this verse. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, are you in Christ? This is what it says. He is a new creation the old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I got to tell you this. I don't always feel like a new creation. My soul feels like oil and water where they, it's not, doesn't feel consistent, right? Like there's two people inside. We learn that true fear, freedom is available to us. One of the points I want to make is this, is that true freedom is not doing what you want. It's doing as you should. And I don't know about you, but often I feel like I can't do what I should do. I always do what I want to do. Sometimes what I should do lines up with what I want to do. But it is so hard to do what we should this was transformational for me about like 12 or so years ago when my pastor on a Sunday morning teaching through the book of Galatians, which is where we're going to be tonight, Galatians chapter 5. And this is the key. Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. And these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things that you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. There is so much power in this truth. I don't know if you came into this place with a deep desire to do the will of God, but you are constantly held back. There is a spiritual battle that is taking place in the unseen parts of our soul. There are forces inside of you that are at war with one another. And the Spirit is calling you right now. This is what's so crazy. Even in this moment, right now, there is a spiritual battle happening in your soul. Some of you are distracted. Some of you are tired from the day. That's the flesh. Some of you are being critical. Some of you are thinking, man, uh, wow, look at that thing over there. and Look at that thing over there. The flesh, right? 
You know that hearing the word of God and hearing it preached is a good thing and receiving it with gladness is a good thing. But even right now, there is a very subtle war happening in your soul. A battle. Your flesh doesn't want to let go. Satan doesn't want you to listen to, his, to God's word. And listen, the world, they want the world's system and everything, it wants you to be trapped in the comfort of just being okay, just being okay. Just being mediocre. The question is, do you want to be set free? And the question that I ask myself often is, can I really? And that's the question we're going to try to answer tonight. We're going to talk about freedom And for some of us, that's terrifying. It's scary to think about being free. Because bondage is all you've known. Every night looking at porn. Every day turning to a girlfriend or boyfriend for your hope. Turning to drugs. You don't, you're scared to be happy. To be Filled with the joy of the Lord because depression is what you've known. It's scary being set free. Just like an animal that's been domesticated all its life and going out into the wild is scary. But are you going to choose victory in your life? But here's the thing. If we don't invite the Holy Spirit to come into this place tonight, we will not see victory. We will not see fruit I want you to invite the Holy Spirit to work in your heart tonight. Allow him to speak to you and change you. In Ephesians 5.18, it says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. We're commanded to be continually filled with the Spirit. Notice that we often attempt to fill ourselves with the fruit of the wine instead of the fruit of the Spirit. What is that? You go and you turn to a physical thing. It might not be wine. A person, a, 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 a physical material thing, and you expect it to bring you joy. But it goes like that, and you just feel sick afterwards. But we are called to be filled with the Spirit continually. So what do we need to do tonight? We need to be filled with the Spirit. John 14, 26 says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you some things, all things things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Here's the thing. I hope when you had each pastor that has spoken to you this weekend, every youth leader that's spoken to you this weekend, I hope that you expected from them that they are being filled with the Spirit. Right? As it says in Galatians 3, 3, oh foolish Galatians, have you began to finish in the flesh what was begun in the Spirit? Right? We can do things in the flesh, speak in the flesh. And I hope that you expected that the people that were speaking, they were allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them. Right? But here's the thing. What we learned from John 14 is that the Holy Spirit is what allows you to understand God's word. You will not be able to comprehend or apply God's word without a fresh filling of the Spirit to be continually filled. Okay? Regardless of what your position on the gifts and all of that, it is clear that we are to be filled with the Spirit to understand the Word of God. So we're going to pray right now. And we're just have a moment of quiet. Number one, in your minds, I want you to pray for me. Not out loud. Just say, Lord, will you fill Pastor Ryan as he speaks forth your Word? And then secondly, I want you to pray for yourself. Lord, will you fill me afresh with your Spirit tonight to hear you? And thirdly, pray for one of your friends next to you. So let's take a second to pray in our hearts quietly. For this reason, I bow my knees before you, Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of your glory, you may grant to us to be strengthened with the power 
through your spirit and our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the depth and length and height and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That we may be filled with the fullness of God. You are able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So, go to Galatians chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can use the, the um, Bibles in front of you. Galatians 5.1. If, how many of you guys have a red shirt um, in the front? Someone, literally stand up. I know you have like a bunch of stuff. See your shirt? All right, that's our verse right there. See in the back where it says, set free for what? Anybody know? Freedom. All right, so that's, you can sit down. Thank you very much. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has what? Set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Why have you been set free? What have you been set free for, I should ask? What have you been set free for? What have you been set free to, I should say? Freedom. To be free. That's why you've been set free. You haven't been set free to be in bondage again, but to be set free for freedom. Some of you have been set free and become children of God, and you're trying to go back to do, doing the Christian life on your own. Galatians 3, 1. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Some of you are still in bondage to sin. You're not a child of God. You haven't received him. Galatians 4, 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. <laughs> this is unreal. We still do this as Christians, but this is what the world does. They give godhood to things that are not gods. You remember Dagon in the temple, right? He fell over before the Ark of the Covenant, right? And they had to go pick him back up, right? We take things and we give power to them, expecting them that they're going to give things that only God can give to us. If you're still in Galatians 5, you can go back to chapter 4, verse 5, and it says, but when the fullness of time had come, here's the good news, here's the gospel, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive the adoptions as sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. How are you set free? You trust in God. You receive his spirit, and then you become his sons, as we were singing. Oh, I've been a Christian for so many years, but do not feel free. Yeah, I am who you say I am. I'm a child of God, but the reality is inside. You go, am I? I grew up in the church. I understand what pastor's kids experience where they're, you could never be real and say, I don't know. And there's a brokenness and a, a, a hiddenness there where you go, I just don't know. I'm going to be honest. Um, several years ago, um, there was a moment where I was like, I don't know if I believe in this whole Christianity thing. Like, I was really secretly battling that while preaching every week. And for me, my biggest doubt wasn't, does God exist? Is the Bible true? My question was, if I'm a new creation, why am I still bound to sin? That was really it. I don't know if anyone is bearing witness with this. I hope you are, but that was me. 
Freedom did not feel like a reality of mine as a Christian. (sighs) Man, I hope you're taking notes. And I hope you're memorizing these verses because this chapter is what changed everything for me. Everything made sense. I had clarity. The doubt went away. And I knew what the key to victory was. Do you want freedom? Whoa. Is everyone awake? Do you want freedom? Okay. (sighs) That was scary. I was like, we spent a lot of time for you guys not to be sure. All right. Okay. So, let's look at verse 16. It says, but I say, walk by the Spirit. How do we experience the fruit of the Spirit? We walk by the Spirit. How do we not gratify the desires of the flesh? We walk by the Spirit. Okay? So how do you walk by the Spirit? That's my question. This is a Bible word we often use. Hey, so Trevor, how's your walk going? You know? Hey, Haven. Are are you walking with the Lord properly today? And you're like, what does that mean? Walk means how you conduct your life. The way that you go about your life. Oh, so you're talking about behavior. Does this mean more Bible reading, more praying, more witnessing, more Bible studies? Those actions are meaningless without faith. Spiritual disciplines, reading your Bible, witnessing, praying, all those things are not spiritual disciplines without what? The Spirit. They're just disciplines. Are you guys tracking it? If you are not trusting in the Spirit to enlighten and empower your Bible reading, it's just a discipline. Let's be super honest. Let's shock everyone in the room right now. Okay, I'm gonna ask you a question. You're gonna raise your hand if it's true of you. Have you ever read your Bible and got nothing out of it that morning? Okay, right? Why? Is it because the Bible is not the living word of God? No, it is. The problem is, is we didn't read it with faith, with the spirit enlightening us as we're reading his word. What is a discipline without the spirit? It's works. Galatians Galatians is all about putting to death the works of the flesh. So how do you walk in the spirit? 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 4, we walk by faith, not faith by sight. It's not what would seem natural, okay? Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through what? Faith. And it is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So how do we walk in the Spirit? By faith. Trusting the Spirit and letting Him lead us. Listen, It's not about your work specifically. It's about your work with the Spirit. Your trust, allowing the Lord to empower those things. And then it says, the rest of verse 16, look down at it. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. It says, when you walk in the Spirit, you will not satisfy your fleshly desires. Desires there is over-desire. Uh, Timothy Keller said this, literally, epithumia means over-desire and inordinate desire and all-controlling drive and longing. This is crucial. The main problem our heart has is not so much desire for bad things, but our over-desires for good things. When a good thing becomes our God, it creates over-desires. Paul says that a sinful desires become deep things that drive and control us. Sin creates in us the feeling that we must have this or that, or the other. My problem is not a desire for sex. It's when that desire becomes an over-desire and is controlling. It's not the fact that I want to eat food. It's when that food consumes me and controls me. It's not that I want a vacation, but the fact that I expect the vacation is going to give me all the rest that I possibly ever needed. Our flesh wants all that is in God's hand, but it doesn't want God. This is a problem with modern Christianity, is we focus so much on what's in his hand instead of himself. The gospel is Jesus. The good news is not specifically that you don't go to hell and you get to go to heaven. That is part of it, but the main thing is that you spend an eternity with Jesus. 
It's being with him. The good news is Jesus. It's him. But yet we turn good things, the gifts he's given us, into God things. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. What are the desires of the spirit? John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. (laughs) This is so good, like, so, so good, all right, like, you ready? Mind-blowing. I don't know if you just saw what, what he said right there. What does the Spirit do? The Spirit points us to Jesus. Okay, I don't know. Like, this was life-changing for me. And listen, I've been marinating for many years so that the good gospel juices have been sinking in for a while. So you might not be marinating a lot. I know we just kind of slapped it on right now. So you're not ready. But here's the cool news, right? The, what, is, what is the desires of the flesh? What did we say the desires of the flesh were? okay. Yes, everything that's in God's hand, but we don't want God. It's an over-desire for good things, isn't it? What is the only thing? There's nothing better than Jesus, ultimate. The spirit is against the flesh. The flesh wants the gifts. The spirit wants to point you to Jesus. How does the spirit comfort you? Showing you Jesus, comforting you. The Spirit empowers you to serve Christ. The Spirit illuminates Christ. The Spirit glorifies Christ. The Spirit's great desire is to make Jesus more precious to you. He cleanses the spiritual lenses of your heart. I can guarantee any sin, any sin in your life that you are walking in is an idolatry problem. Where you made something that is not God, God, and you started worshiping it. So then you had to start worshiping it more, and serving it more, and serving it more. And then what did you experience? Bondage that God set you free from. How are you set free? The Spirit filling you every day by faith. Stepping out as you're reading your Bible. Every, as you're sharing your testimony. As you're praying. Being filled with the Spirit daily. Jesus becomes more precious. See, every sin is connected to a value problem. That you're valuing the wrong things. And so the Spirit illuminates Jesus, says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not on the law. The law, it frustrates. The law, it kills. Growing up in the church, I became an expert level faker. I was so frustrated because I knew better than most what was wrong, but my ability to do what was right was no better. Let me say that again. I was an expert faker. I knew better than anyone else what was wrong, but I had no ability to do what was right more than anyone else. Oh. Christian kid, do you feel that? Guess what? You're just like, it's not like, it's not because I don't know that I shouldn't be doing this, right? You know, you know the law. You grew up in the church. You get it. But yet, you still fall into sin. You hide it. it says, but if you are led to lead through. Does it sound like we act first? It sounds like the Spirit is leading us. He shows up. Is there a certain amount of passion that that we need to have for the spirit to show up? Some kind of formula? 2 Corinthians 12. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here's the thing, weakness can produce a dependent faith. 
Weakness creates a dependent faith. It makes you trust, expect for the Lord to work in your life. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Trusting Him to work and following. There's a lot of difference between believing about God and trusting in God, isn't there? Right? When was the last time you trusted God so much that if he didn't show up, you would look foolish? That as you sat in that chair, if the chair did not have the integrity to hold you up, you would have looked kind of dumb. When's the last time you put trust in God in that way and said, you know what? I'm going to break up with my boyfriend because I'm going to wait for God's timing in my life. And I'm going to stop worshiping the God of romance in my life. I'm going to stop chasing that boy to expect him to give me things that only Jesus can give me. You know what? I'm going to get rid of my cell phone. I'm going to stop hanging out with these friends. When's the last time you trusted in that way that he has something better for you? Is faith in action? Yes, it is. Is it emotion? Yes. Is faith Full surrender, absolutely. It means giving him all. So what will happen when you walk by the Spirit? You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Does this mean you will no longer have fleshly desires? This is the key. This is really good. Look at verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. We're in a battle. Okay, let's be honest again, right? Are we cool with honesty? Okay, eh, sure. All right. How many of you guys have felt like maybe I'm not a Christian because you still struggle with sin? Yeah, I felt that. This is an apologetic right here, right? A, a defending of our faith. I felt this. This is one of the biggest things that I had struggled with. Do you know what verse 17 just said? That if there's a battle, there's evidence that the Spirit's there. For an unbeliever, there's no battle. There may be a conscience that tells you that there's a guilt, but man, Christians battle, right? And it becomes harder when we don't submit to the Spirit, when we don't walk in the Spirit. But the fact that there's, you are battling sin, that you don't want to sin, and you do, and you're in this battle, in this fight, is probably, I can't say, I, I'm, I'm, according to this verse, is that maybe the Spirit is in you, and there is a battle, so how do we win? The inner work of the Spirit in our hearts. Now look at verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are the works of the flesh. He says they are evident. They're like, duh, they're obvious, right? We work to satisfy the flesh with these behaviors. We work to have the idol want, the feelings we want. Man, how much effort do you put in to feed your flesh? Anyone eat lunch today? Anyone plan on eating lunch tomorrow? I hope so. But how often do you get the desire that you want and then you want it again? And that some and what we experience is that when we feed that desire, we just feed it, we just need to feed it more. Have you guys ever had where you start binge eating and then your stomach gets bigger and bigger and then now you eat bigger meals that you couldn't finish before? Anyone been there? right, that you have actually expanded your desire and you have to fulfill more experience to be able to feed that desire. These are out of order desires. It says those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who have only one desire will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians six eleven. And it says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. So what is the result when we walk in the Spirit? Look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Do you see how these two desires at or war with one another? We talked about this last night. That whenever you see the truth of God, you will see a contrary lie to that truth, won't we? Black and white. In the same way, whenever we see a fruit of the Spirit, we will see a work of the flesh on the other side. So, the fruit of the Spirit is love. A work of the flesh is uncleanness, lewdness, and hatred. What is uncleanness, lewdness, and hatred? It's caring more about yourself. And sometimes, we have this thing where we pretend like we love everyone, but we only love them for our own benefit. A false fruit. See, we can do this thing where we create false fruit. Joy, what is the opposite of joy? Envy and jealousy. It's the opposite of long suffering. <laughs> Fornication. Having sex before it is your time, out of its context. I need a, I know, you know, there's another false fruit. I think a lot of times. We get this fruit thing mixed up because we think that we're supposed to be producing the fruit. What we're supposed to be doing is submitting to the spirit and allowing the fruit to work out in our lives. And so we bring these false fruits, these artificial fruits. And an artificial version of long suffering is cynicism. A lack of care. Dude, I know this is about to call some people out. You may act like you're enduring and persevering. But all you are is apathetic. All you are is jaded. All you are is closed off. What do we see Jesus do? Enduring the suffering. Right? Walking through the suffering. Not cynicism. That's a false fruit. You may look like, oh, I'm being really patient. But it's just cynicism. Peace. Trusting in God in the midst of tense circumstances was the opposite. Dissensions and heresies. Not trusting God's word or his people. A false fruit of that is apathy. Marginalizing the tension. And we can go through the list. Notice it's a work of the flesh and a fruit of the spirit. John 15, 5 says this. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot be loving unless you have received love from the Father. You cannot have joy without knowing the one who endured. You cannot know peace until you know the Prince of Peace. You cannot know long suffering until you know he sustains you. Do you see how this continues? It's the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit working to be in intimate relationship with Him, Him working through your life. Fruit is always about sitting in the vine. One of my favorite places in the world since I moved to Arizona, never been there before until I moved here, was Sedona. Oh my gosh, I love Sedona. Have you, anybody ever been to West Fork Trail? Anybody be there? Um, there's this sweet spot. I'm pretty sure it might be private property, but... Yeah. Um, but like right next to West Fork Trail is the Oak Creek, right? Where Oak Creek and West Fork Trail uh, Creek come together. You guys know that spot? And there's those houses off to the left. I went there one day and I was there with my best friend and we took out some like, um, the words are not coming. Oh, chairs. And so we took out these chairs and we took out and we put them in the creek and the water's like this high. And like, you know, in a pool when it has that like cool, like, like light thing it does, you know what I'm talking about? Like, I'm trying to be descriptive, but I'm being really bad at being descriptive. But like you can imagine it with my hands, right? It does this thing. And it's blue. In Sedona, because the floor of the water is red because of the red rock, it's like green and red and gold. And then the sun was shining through like Oak Creek. It's just like, pfft. and I'm just sitting there and I'm just sitting in my chair and I was abiding. I'm telling you, I was abiding because I was like, Anybody ever like those moments or like when I'm sitting on my Chase Lounge in front of my big window and I live over by Willow Creek and I can see the Dells and like Willow Creek, Willow Lake, and you can see the snow. Like, dude, snow in Arizona is weird. It does this. It doesn't do that in California. It's just like, 
straight down. But it does this thing. It's super cool, and it's like calming to the soul, the warm fire is going, all that stuff. Just to abide, to rest, to trust in the moment. To rest in Jesus that way. Not toiling, not trying to work, but trusting in Jesus. Look at verse 24. And those who belong to Christ have been crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Our desires died with Christ, and we come alive to better desires. Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I who does the living, it's who? It's Christ. We live by faith in who? Whose love is our motivation? It's Jesus. I hope this sinks into your heart. Because there's kids who are struggling in this room with same-sex attraction. Kids struggling with depression. Kids struggling with really, really heavy things. And they've given their heart to Jesus, maybe even prayed the prayer. But they just feel battle. Addicted to pornography. Addicted to drugs. Just constantly sad. Just the weight of the flesh. And you're just like, I just don't know. Like, it just... It, I hope you heard what we what I taught what we what the word taught tonight. Is that the spirit allows you to be free. It's when you trust the work of the spirit in your life, inviting him into your life, doing the things that you should under the power of the spirit that he sets us free. He sustains and empowers. All right, we're going to close with uh, three last songs. Um, I'm going to pray for us. We're going to do a group picture at some point um, from the balcony after um, our second song. Our, yeah, second song. So you guys are free to come up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be glorified. Lord, we pray that you would empower. Lord, I pray for every one of my brothers and sisters that they would experience victory over their sin, victory over their emotions. Victory over their out of order desires. Lord, that you would become God above all else. Lord, we pray that you would fill us with your joys. We worship you with these closing songs. In Jesus' name, amen.